what I wanted to do th this morning is just to, um, to just give a, an update of what's happening on this particular topic in, in Africa at the moment. And I'll try to link that a bit to my own, my own work. I'm, I'm just very lucky to have uh, Anne speak before me because the con Anne has really done a great job setting the context for, uh, for my own presentation. Um, I want to put this in a long-term perspective, just like what, what does it, what would it take African countries uh, to really effectively address their agricultural challenges uh, and putting this in the long-term perspective. And the reason I put that in the, want to put that in the long-term perspective is because it takes about maybe 20 to 30 years to get any new products adopted. Uh, and so the, the technologies that will be solving Africa's agricultural challenges 20, 30 years from now are the ones that are being developed today. And this is not unique to Africa. This is a, a very well established view that it takes that long to get products from the, from the lab to the marketplace. Uh, Anne has already talked a bit about just that only a very small number of countries essentially benefited from the so-called Green Revolution, which is Mexico, India, the Philippines, uh, and a few others. A large part of Africa was really uh, didn't benefit at all. And as a consequence, as you can see, uh, per capita agricultural production in Africa has remained uh, fairly flat over the years. Uh, and so being, addressing that challenge will take, in, in my view, very significant efforts that I, I, I would characterize them as basically an exercise in technological <laughs> leapfrogging in that it's not going to be done through incremental adjustments in agriculture is going to take uh, really major leaps and taking advantage of emerging technologies. And most of those are technologies that are being developed, uh, being de developed today. Uh, we have, a, just to give the context, you have extreme variability uh, in, a, in a rainfall, uh, which is to a large extent the main source uh, of challenges for the continent, but it also defines the ecology, Africa's ecology. And then you have more difficult challenges that have to do with the just lack of electricity, uh, very limited road networks, uh, very poor railway connections. So you can produce stuff in various parts of Africa, but you cannot, uh, in fact, transport it. Uh, and this is, in my view, this is in fact the, the most significant limiting factor to African agriculture has to do with it, more to do with the infrastructure and less to do, uh, in fact, with the plant breeding. Uh, you can grow it, but you can't transport it. And that's, that's uh, farmers are smart enough to know that uh, it doesn't make sense to grow something you cannot, uh, you cannot actually transport. And then there's a, another dimension, which is just the size of the continent itself, it just makes really difficult to think about connecting countries uh, and, and being able to invest in a infrastructure across a across number of countries. It's, uh, it's big enough. You can feed the United States in there, uh, China, Western Europe, India, Argentina, and have sufficient room to, to sneak in your former colonizer. <laughs> And, and th this, this has real consequences for what you can actually do because you have to plan everything at the right scale right from the beginning. Uh, you can't say, I'll, just, I'll take on the African continent village by village. That would just not, not work at all. Uh, you really have to think at, at a scale that could, could actually make a difference. And that's really what got me thinking about what are these big leaps that need to be done. And the first. And the one I really want to talk about a little bit more is a, a leap in the way we think about uh, agriculture and food production. And up to recently, the idea, uh, really the focus was thinking about food security in the classical sense of, of it, which is basically being able to provide calories. And, and I think Anne covered that really, uh, really well. Uh, and I thought that one way to approach it is to approach it as economic development, not just as providing food. 
uh, because every time you talk about providing food, somebody will show up and say exactly the, the point that was made earlier, that there is enough food in the world, what the problem is distribution. Uh, and that's such a, such a fallacious argument, because it's like saying, there's enough money in the banks, why don't we just distribute it? Everybody will be better off. Uh, it doesn't actually make sense. And it's not, go, it's not called agriculture for nothing. It's called agriculture because it's a culture, it's a way of life. Uh, and so what we try to do over the years is basically help African leaders start to think about agriculture as being contaminants with the economy. That if your agriculture is not growing, especially in an African context, chances are that your economy is not, is not growing. And there, there are two, two main reasons why that is the case. One is uh, the bulk of the population is in rural areas. Uh, and 70% of the employment generated in Africa is generated in agriculture. For most African countries, agriculture accounts for roughly 30% of the GDP of those countries. And if you establish co connections between agriculture and ag agribusiness, probably the percentage is much, is much larger. And that led me to the view that uh, if the continent is not improving its agriculture, chances are that it's not improving uh, I its economy generally. And that's what led me into writing this book, uh, the, the New Harvest, which is uh, you don't have to buy it. Uh, the entire text is available uh, on, on our website. Um, I'm grateful to the Gates Foundation that has made it possible for us uh, to make the book available. We've distributed roughly 30,000 copies, uh, mostly in African countries. And I, I wrote the book as a memo to African presidents. And the reason I focused on uh, African presidents was, was because to, to advance or modernize agriculture takes more than just the, the functions of the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, if you take, for example, transportation, which is a, extremely critical, that's not controlled by the Minister for Agriculture. Finance is controlled by the Minister for Finance. Uh, so the Minister for Agriculture cannot really make critical decisions on subsidies to various crops. That's a decision that is made by the Minister for Finance. So it became very clear to me that uh, the only way you can get this large-scale integrated coordination between various key ministries uh, is, on, is to get to the presidents. And you can't get to the presidents unless you define it as economic development. If you define it as food security, the president will just basically send it to uh, the Minister for Food Aid to go and, and talk to the, uh, to the donors. And, and that's what we did with the book, is go to the presidents. It was launched uh, in the, by f five East African presidents uh, in December 2010, and uh, one, uh, with the support of the president of Tanzania. And he did something which was really interesting after the book was launched. He went and met with the leaders of the business community at the World Economic Forum in Davos and got them to commit $3.5 billion to African agriculture. This is the first thing that he, that he did. Uh, and I was almost like bullying him because every time I saw somebody going to Tanzania, I would autograph a copy of the book and I would, I would send it to him. So when, so when the fourth copy arrived, his special assistant called, called me and said, Calestas, the president has heard you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand the meaning of that term. It turned out that they were just boarding the plane to go to Davos to talk with the, with the industry leaders, and they made that commitment. He's been a, really an excellent champion of agriculture. He got re-elected on an agricultural platform. He was the first, actually the second African president to run on an agriculture platform. The first one was the late president of, uh, of Malawi. Uh, and this was, a, for me, fr just from a political point of view, was a, a major breakthrough to actually have a real, a real champion at the executive level who not only understood it, but was willing to go out uh, and advocate it. Uh, at the end of, of January, uh, the African Union, Union hosted a summit whose theme was agricultural transformation, uh, and as you can notice from that title, that was the theme, there's no food security in the title. If you go back to the launching of the book, 
uh, you see it was a, a retreat on food security and climate change. Uh, that has disappeared uh, from the terminology. And that's, this is very significant because it shows that the leadership, the African leaders are starting to see agriculture as a driver for economic transformation and not just simply being able to provide, uh, to provide calories. And the, what, the reason why this is important is because it's happening also at a period when the continent uh, is basically at the moment, for the first time in the history of, the, of Africa, the continent is growing faster than the world average, growing roughly at 3.5% per year. Uh, so, so that's leading to just a greater optimism, but many African countries have resources to invest in agriculture. A large part of that growth is in fact accounted for by previous investments in agriculture. Uh, many countries that have grown fairly fast, uh, Rwanda was the first one to revive its economy after gen of the genocide. Their most significant investments were in fact initially in agriculture and then they diversified to, uh, to other activities. So the question, the question that I, I try to answer in the book, and that's uh, really what I wanted to focus on here, uh, is where, where are the sources of possibilities for technological leapfrogging going to come from. And one obvious area is this notion of exponential technology growth, technological growth, that knowledge is accumulating at a much faster rate uh, to a levels where present generations are inheriting much larger quantities of scientific and technical knowledge compared to their predecessors. And that, that is, uh, in some fields, technical knowledge is doubling every 12 months information and communications technologies. And that means that uh, the challenge for African countries is no longer uh, one of worrying about uh, scarcity of knowledge, which is what gave us the old debates around intellectual property rights. Uh, the worry that because knowledge was scarce, therefore you wanted to focus on those elements, those policy instruments that might limit uh, access to that knowledge. Today we have exactly the opposite, which is, uh, which is abundance. And that has created new kinds of policy questions. No longer worrying about those uh, activities that restrict the flow of knowledge, but in fact worrying about those institutions that allow African countries to absorb the available knowledge and put it to agricultural use. So it's a very different way uh, of uh, thinking about economic policy. We never had uh, situations where the, the challenge was managing abundance. Uh, most of the debates are around, uh, around managing scarcity. And we've seen this happen in the case of, uh, in, the case, in the story of mobile phones. Uh, um, they are called mobile phones not because you carry them around. The reason they're called mobile phones is because the first mobile phone telephone developed by Ericsson, the Swedish company in 1956, when they finally found out it worked, that it worked, they asked one of the engineers, say, what are we going to call it? And he said, call it Mobile Telephone A. But it weighed 42 kilos. <laughs> you, could not, you could not use it to update your Facebook status. <laughs> there was a, no possibility. It was only accessible to pu public institutions, the military, uh, the, the police, uh, f fire stations. Those are the only institutions that could afford, uh, afford having, having a telephone. Uh, you needed a car to transport it. That's why it was called mobile, because you could use it, put it in a car and transport it. Uh, and this is just the unit that this excludes the, the antenna and the battery. In fact, the whole unit cost more than the car at the time. Uh, this was not an unusual scene uh, or in uh, Chicago, New York, to have senior executives really who are really at the cutting edge of uh, mobile communication at the time. But it took one guy, Marty, Marty Cooper at Motorola, who had observed this exponential growth in capabilities, we go back to this idea of exponential growth, to reason that this could become ubiquitous if you invested in it. Uh, he spent 10 years working on it. When he released it in 1983, uh, people joked about it, calling it a brick. Uh, it weighed two kilos, cost $5,000, it took about 10 hours to charge, about 30 minutes to talk. Uh, but there were optimists who believed that this could be improved upon and they continued working, working on it. Uh, this is uh, 
of, this was an, an Ethiopian person who found out that herdsmen actually wanted to remain connected, but, but wanted to keep their hands free. So, so, so I consider this to be the first Bluetooth. <laughs> uh, the rest of the story is very well known, but what I wanted to point out here is that we moved, say, from the, the mobile, mobile phone becoming a platform for new industries, which is the money transfer industry, uh, basically invented in Africa, invented in Kenya by Kenyans. They didn't invent the mobile phone, but they invented a new business. Uh, and now it's being applied to agriculture. This is a very, a very interesting. This is an app uh, where basically dairy farmers provide technical details and, and they, they, don't, they don't have to go and look for a vet. A vet studies the information online and calls the farmer instead of the farmer going to look for a vet. Uh, and this, uh, there are numerous applications. What's interesting is that many of these are being directed at agriculture, which is a uh, which is a very promising area of uh, application of modern technologies. And so I'm using this as an example of what could be done in other fields as well, uh, where we've seen technological leapfrogging in the telecommunications sector, and its applications are being extended, to, being extended to agriculture. The biggest challenge has always been connectivity, and this was, uh, this was how Africa looked like uh, in 2009, with a fiber optic cable only on the west coast of Africa. The rest of the, of the continent was relying on very costly, uh, slow uh, satellite connectivity. Uh, and that's what the continent looks like today. There's all these investments have been made in the last four years. It's roughly $4 billion in undersea cables, and then probably between six and seven billion dollars invested in terrestrial cables just on Eastern and Southern Africa alone. Uh, and the reason, this, the reason this has been made is because African investors and governments see the value uh, of extending infrastructure. And a, large, a lot of it is in fact starting to connect rural areas. So some of the biggest beneficiaries of fiber optic connectivity are going to be farmers. And that makes it possible for them to leapfrog and you can start to think of various ways by, by which they can use that capability through education, communications with other farmers, uh, marketing of their products. Uh, another interesting f detail is that roughly between 50 and 60% of that investment is by Africans themselves. If you take one example, which is the Seacom cable, this red cable that connects uh, Southern Africa with Europe, uh, was launched in uh, 2009. Uh, this was the president of Tanzania connecting to, and, uh, and lecturing me on the technical details behind fiber optic, optic connectivity. That cable uh, does $160 million. So roughly 76% of that investment is by African shareholders, uh, which again reinforces the view that if you have, an, you have, have a good idea that has a potential impact on the economy, you will get uh, you'll get local investors to put, uh, to put money in it. I use that as an example because it's the same story we are starting to see in the area of, in the area of genomics, with advances in gen genomics. When the human genome was sequenced uh, in 2001, it cost about $100, $100 million to sequence it. Uh, it took about 13 years. Uh, and you can see the really dramatic drop Again, exponential drop in the cost of sequencing of genomes. Uh, today, as of December last, last year, we are down to about $1,000 to sequence a, a genome in two hours. And that's just incredible capability that has been accumulated. The biggest challenge is no longer sequencing genomes, but figuring out what that genetic information can do, which gets back to Anne's point about characterizing different crops and seeing uh, how you can start to adapt them to different uh, ecological conditions. Uh, we've seen just the rapid expansion of the adoption of genetically modified crops. It's been extremely uh, controversial in many places. But it's been a very small number of traits, just about three traits. If you just to think about when you start to sequence these genomes, uh, what the possibilities that exist uh, that allow you to characterize the the composition of these crops, but also to adapt them to different, uh, 
different ecological conditions. Africans are starting to use that technology differently uh, in that in the, in the US, the technology is used mostly to basically for large scale farmers who are starting to see that in Africa, the research is starting to focus on, on basically leveraging the technology to meet the needs of small scale farmers. Again, you see an analogy there between the mobile phones uh, and, and genomics, uh, mostly controlling crops. This is a, a banana wilt that is destroying Uganda staple, not just Uganda, but in fact, several other East African countries. It's estimated that the region loses somewhere in the neighborhood of $500 million a year because of, of banana wilt. And the Ugandan scientists, in fact, have used genetic en engineering techniques to develop new varieties that are resistant uh, to, uh, to that disease. Uh, similarly, you have this Maruka pests in West Africa, which destroys uh, pigeon eyed peas. This is a, Nigeria alone spends some, somewhere in the neighborhood of $350 million a year uh, importing uh, pesticides, and they are not very effective. Nigerian scientists have already developed new varieties using genetic modification that, uh, in fact, would stand that. We have similar problems with, with cassava, with the diseases spreading from Central Africa to various, various countries. The biggest threat is probably uh, to Nigeria, which is the world's largest producer of, uh, uh, of cassava. Again, these are diseases that are very difficult to control using conventional methods, and probably the only way to do it is going to be through uh, genetic modification. The, we have questions of drought. There's research going on on drought control. And, and of course, uh, Anne's important point about div diversification of, uh, of crops of trying to recruit crops that have not, have only been co consumed previously in localized areas and expanding that, uh, broadening their use in various countries. And that's where genomics essentially co comes in. We've seen just recently the establishment in Nairobi uh, of the African Orphans Consortium, which is a group that is going to sequence about 100 African indigenous crops. And the purpose for doing that sequencing is basically to, not only to understand their genetic characteristics, but also to, to be able to adapt them to different ecological conditions. Uh, they are doing this in partnership with the Mars Corporation, which is a, a chocolate company that has a broader interest in agriculture generally. And the, the champion behind it is a, a colleague of ours, Howard, Howard Shapiro. Uh, who is very, very focused in making sure that African countries can have access uh, to man, many of these technologies. Uh, I think that in the future, as we start to think about biotechnology, many African countries are going to start thinking about the applications, especially in the livestock sector, and fisheries might be probably a starting point now that we have technologies that allow you to grow uh, fish on land uh, of most of Africa, African countries, the population is in the interior, it's not on the coastline. Probably 60% of Africa's population is in the interior. Therefore, the technologies that have been developed here, especially for fast growth, uh, might end up being applied uh, in a number of African countries. I know this is a very controversial topic here, and I'm happy to discuss it uh, at a later time. I want to just touch on a few other emerging technologies that I think will have a, a big impact on African agriculture, and some of it is already being tried at the moment. The biggest, one of the biggest challenges is having adequate and timely information that can help farmers to make decisions. And up to now, we were hoping that small satellites, cu cubes of this size, will become the future for uh, enabling Africans to monitor the ecology on a regular basis, collect the information that is needed, and put it to effective use. Uh, but in fact, this is probably going to be disrupted by the use of drones for civilian purposes. And the biggest use of drones, in my view, uh, is going to be in agriculture, especially with crop monitoring, data collection. Uh, and uh, many rice farmers, for example, have real problems keeping birds off their farms, so they use chemicals to try to kill birds. I can imagine, for example, drones that fly around and scare off farmers, I mean, scare off birds. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it's just left to, left to imagination. Uh, I have a few, a few minutes left. I think I will skip the slides on uh, nanotechnology. I can come back to that on, uh, when we have a discussion, uh, the Q&A later on. I wanted to touch a bit on uh, what I think are the most important uh, public policy questions that the continent faces at the moment. Uh, the first is this whole area of infrastructure. I mean, as I pointed out, uh, am I just ruining my own presentation here? <laughs> Power is probably the biggest challenge. If you can't, if you don't have electricity, you really just you can't you can't modernize agriculture. It's just self-evident, and so we are starting to see countries starting to invest uh, significantly in uh, in electrification. Uh, Angola, Angola just devoted $24 billion uh, for electrification uh, between now and 2017. Uh, Ethiopia just launched a big infrastructure program that includes electrification. That's an area that we're going to see a lot of work going on. The second is, uh, is road networks, especially rural roads. Uh, uh, much, you take Ethiopia, for example, only about 11% of the population lives within an, uh, an old weather road. The figure for Kenya is about 24, uh, 24%. Uh, and so expanding rural roads is going to be a critical element. And my own proposal actually has been to basically call on the military, African militaries. They have the equipment, they have a lot of manpower. Many of the best engineers in African countries are in the military. And it's starting to happen. The president of Uganda is established recently a military, a university of military science and technology, but it's training railway engineers. And he calls it that because the budget comes from the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Defense. So again, leveraging the power of presidents who have access to different sources of funds to basically focus on agriculture. Uh, the second area is going to be reforming edu educational systems so that uh, especially faculties of agriculture can grow crops instead of growing bureaucracies. Uh, because most African students go to work, when they graduate, they go to work in government rather than go to become farmers. Uh, and one area that I'm working on at the moment is to encourage African countries to start creating commodity-based universities that focus on the full value chain of the main commodities that they, they, they produce. So that instead of having regular departments, basically to focus on, uh, on commodities and look at all the, all the way from science to food waste and conservation activities. And that allows you also to address the nutritional questions uh, if, if you have a, an integrated university of, the, of that kind. And secondly, to have those universities to be more closely connected with farmers. A uh, question of regional integration, which goes back to the size of the continent, that you need to create larger markets. Um, and, and the only way to do that is to get countries to work together. The, limit, the limiting factor has been infrastructure because you need to build roads, railways, and that requires essential training in the engineering sciences. And, and lead, leadership, leadership becomes really... <laughs> leadership becomes really important, and this is why I've seen most progress. Uh, by the way, I, this, I, I show this to African presidents, and they don't laugh. <laughs> And I've told them, I said, the purpose of an African president is not to sit there and just look pretty. They have to, do, they have to get some work, uh, some work done. And they are doing, I'll give you a couple of examples. This is the president of Senegal. I was having a conversation with him. He, he, he's put agriculture at the center of his activities. He's abolished his, uh, one of the senates to put money in infrastructure development. Uh, and uh, this is the president of, Tanzan you know, of, uh, of Nigeria, who is uh, declared in the cabinet that he was only going to eat cassava bread and nothing else. <laughs> and uh, and uh, last week, he launched a research and innovation council. Uh, actually, early this week, he launched a research and innovation council, which he chairs himself. And large part of the work of that research and innovation council is going to be to, to promote agricultural research uh, and innovation, and he's declared that for Nigeria, as far as his, so long as he's president, agriculture is going to be the new oil. 
uh, that's how he, he thinks about it. So, so, so when given all this in terms of uh, what, the, what the continent might look like, uh, this is my view of what the continent might look like in a few years. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. Why don't you sit on the far side so I can see the screen here? That was super. That was great. This is, a, this is an opera house. So. <laughs> <laughs> we like it. We like, we like the drone. That's great. <laughs> I want to uh, uh, applaud and congratulate the audience who have been asking questions. First off, for keeping them to questions. We appreciate that. And, and for keeping them concise. Let's, let's uh, hope that continues. So questions for uh, right starting here. Mike, too. Could you say a few words about population growth in Africa? Yeah, good, good question. I think in the next 30 years, one of the biggest surprises we are likely to see uh, in the population is going to be in Africa globally. Uh, and my signal for that is the rapid rate at which the continent is urbanizing. And we know that urban populations usually are associated with low rates of fertility. And Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent. There's some evidence of that already in various countries uh, that uh, you see significant reduction in fertility as people migrate to urban areas. The, quest the big question is actually making those cities productive so that economically productive, so, you, uh, they, so that they are not, in fact, say if you have urban dwellers but they are using charcoal, that is not helping. So I've been working quite a bit with the, with the governor of the state of Lagos on how to redefine Lagos as an innovation hub so that you can have productivity in Lagos that does not have a significant impact in, in the neighborhood. Uh, so so, so I, th I think we're going to see surprises and there's a bit of evidence of it. My biggest concern with the population has is, is been the low level of investment uh, in uh, science and technology, particularly for the youth, uh, which is uh, the quality of the population for me is more interesting than the numbers. And if we don't raise the, po the quality of the population, the numbers will continue to be high. So, so a, l a large part of my work is focusing just on promoting science and technology so you can have capability in the population so they don't have to have too many people. Great. Next question for Clusters, I think, was up here. Mike three. Hi, my name's. Oops. My name's Kelsey. I'm a student at the University of New England. Um, I was just wondering how you're taking climate change into consideration when developing these new agricultural and like technology infrastructures, such as like renewable energies and dealing with the droughts in Africa that climate change will make worse. Yeah, this is, uh, that's why African agriculture has to be knowledge intensive, because if it's not knowledge intensive, it is not, it is not going to adapt to climate change. Uh, and uh, the, the whole area of sequencing of genomes, that makes it easier to do maintenance breeding so that you don't have to have these dramatic switches in crops that can actually help crops to adapt to climate change. Uh, secondly, a more effective monitoring of the changes. Uh, which is what got me interested in, uh, in satellite technology. Uh, that if we need to make those, uh, get the necessary information, timely information that helps you to, to make the decisions. Uh, and thirdly, to leverage the power of uh, emerging technologies. I didn't get into the details with, the, with nanotechnology, but I'm working with a large group of people who are looking at new materials that uh, could be used for infrastructure, for example, uh, uh, water resistant uh, polymers that you can wrap around your infrastructure so that it's not destroyed by changes in humidity. 
for example, or allows, prevents pests from getting into your wood. Um, I'm working with a group of scientists from India at the moment looking at uh, how to waterproof roads. Uh, because when you have these significant variations in rainfall, you design a road for low rainfall, and then that area becomes uh, susceptible to increases in rainfall. You need to find a way of waterproofing it. And there are ma material now, it's material now that allows basically those roads to repel, uh, repel water. Uh, the other area that I'm working on is water absorbent materials. This is a polymers that will absorb up to about 100 times as much water as, it, as its own weight, uh, which means you can bury that material under the ground, and when it rains, in the case of reduction of rainfall, it will capture all the, all the water, and only a growing plant can extract it. Uh, and that, that those polymers uh, are in use. I'm working with the government of Slovenia at the moment, uh, which small country of two million people, but they have some of the world's best polymer scientists. So a couple of years ago, I went to see their president to see if the, the president could make this as a mission, diplomatic mission of Slovenia to share its polymer know-how. And we have pilots going on at the moment in Kenya and, uh, and Ethiopia. So climate change, agriculture was invented, in fact, to, to respond to ecological change. And we need to, to do even more of it. Great. Over here, Mike One. Jim Settley from the University of Maine, uh, contributing to the sellout with about 60 University of Maine students here and in uh, Belfast. Uh, sir, we, I teach an environmental security course, and we talk about uh, environmental issues as a, uh, as a diplomatic tool, so environmental diplomacy. I get, I get excited when I hear your presentation and I think about the agricultural issues in Africa as an agricultural diplomacy tool. I see the presidents of different countries coming together talking on this subject when, or on other subjects, maybe security or, or pieces where they may not. Is that something that's part of your thought process as you move forward? I know it's about taking care of African problems by African people, but, a, but agricultural diplomacy, I mean, I see it, a, an opportunity for countries to come together on a common issue and maybe have it expand to other, other areas. Interesting point. I've, I've worked and written stuff exactly on this. I've been working with the Brazilian colleagues on engaging with Africa on agriculture, but from a diplomatic point of view, not just from a technical collaboration point of view. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's happened in Africa that makes this possible is the increase in the number of African presidents who have a technical training. A couple of years ago, uh, six African countries elected engineers for president. And uh, it's the highest concentration of, of any continent having engineers as president. That's uh, e Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, Senegal, uh, Angola, and there are several other African countries already had engineers for president. And a concrete example I can give you is one of, a, of, a, of Tunisia that constituted a new a new cabinet recently. And the Minister for Foreign Affairs is a, an engineer by training. So I called him up after he was sworn in. I had a conversation with him and said, what do you plan to do as a, a Minister for Foreign Affairs now that you are, because you are an engineer by training? And he said, the first thing I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to, maybe I shouldn't be saying this on record, but I know that he's going to do it. He said, I'm going to get rid of security attaches in our embassies because the job of the, the old security attaches was to look, is to keep an eye on opponents of the government. I want to appoint science and technology attaches. And a large part of that is going to be focusing on agricultural diplomacy. If you remember Tunisia, it was because, because of food prices that the, the political crisis erupted in the first place. Uh, so this is a very important area of thinking about how countries can collaborate. Uh, ess essential on the agriculture theme. We're going to go up to the balcony, in Mike 3. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Carol Pickering, and I'm with um, Deedal Partners. We're a philanthropic advisory firm, and I'm in Portland. And I have a question about the aquaculture potential in Africa, and specifically the, the potential for new protein sources. But I'd be curious to learn from you what are some of the potential challenges of developing aquaculture in Africa? Yeah, yeah. interesting question. Africa experimented with a, 
in the 70s and 80s, there are a lot of programs across the continent to promote aquaculture, and they were complete, a complete failure. Uh, and uh, I had a student of mine who was interested in this, so I, I sent him to Thailand and Kenya to, do, to find out why Thailand worked and in Kenya it didn't. I came back with a very clear conclusion, which was that in, in Thailand, they took the agricultural incentives and applied them to, uh, to aquaculture. Kenya didn't do that. There are no incentives to support aquaculture. They don't call it fish farming for nothing. It's because they are using the, the farming incentives to support aquaculture. So the incentives part was, is, a big, is a big issue in terms of uh, support for aquaculture. The second is essentially uh, knowledge. There's very limited knowledge on how you breed some of these traditional uh, uh, sp African species. Uh, and this is why I'm interested in the knowledge that's being developed here, but applying it, in fact, to, to African fish. And secondly, the fact that you can do land-based aquaculture creates new opportunities where you can minimize the potential ecological harm uh, of doing aquaculture. So in all these cases, Africa will have to do it differently, will have to, will have to leapfrog. They can't do it the way it has been done in the past, which has been very damaging to the environment. Over here, Mike One. Thank you. Uh, a quick question. First, thanks for uh, using the exponential charts. That's wonderful. And second, distributed energy. What's the role of that, do you think, in the future of improving agricultural output and quality in Africa? Yeah, yeah. The, the, first, the first thing is that there is a lot of interest in renewable energy sources, uh, solar, wind, uh, that can take advantage of advances in smart grids. But I think Africa is starting off from such a low base uh, that is going to be a while because, before they become important. So what I see, foresee happening is, in fact, hybrid systems where you have a coupling between grids and decentralized systems. And the big debate that's going on in many African countries is actually this feed-in tariffs, how you, how you actually manage that. But I think we're going to have a, have a, a period of coexistence between uh, centralized and decentralized systems. Uh, in the long run, as technologies advance, I, I can see, in fact, decentralized systems playing a much bigger, much bigger role, especially in localized markets, where you can't extend a grid there, but if you have, say, fish processing occurring on the shores of Lake Victoria, you can create its own decentralized energy systems to support, support that. We're going to take a question from one of our satellite facilities. Have you noticed a demand for American brands in Africa? Cheaper and less nutritious imports, perhaps? And, and how has this affected African farmers? The, if if the, anybody who hasn't noticed American brands in Africa hasn't been looking. <laughs> <laughs> I think the debate is now shifting to, can we start to have African brands mm. as well? And that's mm. where Anne's point about getting African crops into the, globally, the global market becomes really, really interesting mm. as, as far as I'm concerned. And so, so I have a different interest. We have had, already had a lot of uh, large-scale foreign brands in Africa. We need to see more of African brands as well, and they are going to be linked to, they are going to, be linked to new crops, I think. Great. Over here, Mike too. Hi, uh, Dave Gustafson, really enjoyed the talk and I'll be speaking this afternoon. Um, a little bit, I was wondering if you could follow up on the situation in Nigeria in particular. Obviously the announcement is very encouraging, but there are threats to the north and northeast with security and, and how much uh, do you think those could intervene to sort of slow down progress? It's security concerns basically in country. Yeah, this is a steering off beyond my area of expertise and comfort. But, uh, but I can tell you what I've actually publicly written on in regard to Nigeria, uh, which is that the North feels isolated economically. And one way to stimulate growth in the North is first to expand infrastructure because you, ca you can't have any growth without infrastructure. And so the president has been focusing on, first of all, just making sure that the, the, the Lagos Kano Railway actually functions. 
Uh, and I, so, so my view is that one way to solve the conflict challenges in Africa, is uh, Nigeria particularly, is going to be twofold. One is deal with it as a security question, but the solutions are going to be development ones. In the long run, it's going to be we're finding ways by which you can make the North grow and feel included in the economic prosperity of the rest of the country. And the first frontier, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be, is going to be infrastructure investments. We're going to go up to the balcony for mic three. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chris Goodney with University of Maine. And my question is, is if the US has access to the massive amounts of technology, not the specific ones, but just access to technology in general, and we haven't exactly managed our crops to the best of the ability, how do you propose that Africa would go about it in increasing technology there? I think it hasn't worked here because the last, I would say the last uh, 20, 20 years or maybe a little more than that, the United States has neglected its land grant colleges. Uh, and, uh, Uh, the, the president issued an executive order just recently creating these knowledge hubs to enable farmers to adapt to climate change. Uh, I should hope that those hubs will be, in fact, a bit more closely related to uh, universities. Uh, much of my work in Africa is to really push for the creation of a new generation of universities that will focus on creating links with the farmers, very much along the lines of the original land grant uh, model here, but with a focus on these new challenges which have to do with, the, uh, have to do with the climate change. Uh, the, the best mechanism for transferring knowledge uh, from research institutions into the economy is called commencement. <laughs> And, and, and so, uh, so if, you are not, if your students are not uh, linked to research institutions, you're not going to have much benefit. Unfortunately for Africa, you have a history of separation between research happening in national research institutes and uh, teaching happening in universities. Universities teach, but don't do research. Research institutes do uh, research, but they don't teach. And my effort at the moment is try to encourage leaders to bring those together. Uh, the president of Tanzania has created four new universities that seek to do exactly that, but they happen to be located in the Ministry of Communication, Science and Technology. They are not in the Ministry of Agriculture, because the Ministry of Agriculture is focused, sorry, the Ministry of Education is focused on, a, on a diplomas, uh, not on a connect on the productive sector. So we're starting to see these very interesting experiments happening where you have a new species of universities, but, but they are sprouting in a functional ministries like Ministry of Telecoms. Several African countries now have telecoms universities that are under Ministry of Telecoms, not under Ministry of Education. Uh, and that's the way I'm thinking about, uh, about, about the future of African, African universities. And of course, the US, I hope that it can revisit the role of land grant colleges. The president has been talking about manufacturing hubs where you can have universities be engaged in manufacturing. That's the same logic of that land grant colleges, but I think, I think we need to go back to revisit their, their, their roles and support them. That's all we're gonna have time for right now. I thank Calestas thank again. You. Thank you. Both informative and entertaining, it's great. <laughs>